It was so good to be back. Amy and I were grateful just to get a break. And what a blessing it is to have elders, especially elders who step up and preach. And Paul did such a great job last week, didn't he, in preaching a very solid, challenging message. So grateful for that. We're glad to be back. We've been in this series where we've been looking uh, in Scripture in the book of Genesis from the fall. And next week we're going to end with the call of Abraham Last week, uh, Paul, he talked to you about two covenants, the covenant of the rainbow and the covenant of the blood, the blood pointing to Jesus Christ, who would give his life for us, pour his blood out for the forgiveness of our sins, and the rainbow that represented a sign, a symbol, that God would not flood the earth the way he did in the days of Noah. And I love what Paul said is, that, that we're allowing those symbols of Christianity to be stolen by the world and they're being used to support and encourage immorality. And the church needs to be bold enough to take those symbols back. And so I'm grateful that Paul preached on that covenant. We're so afraid to wear the rainbow anymore. Why? Because it stands in our culture for sexual immorality. But remember that it's a sign from God. And every time it rains and you see a rainbow, you ought to stop and thank God for his goodness, his glory, and his grace, because that's what it stands for. And we're going to talk today about the conceit, the pride, the arrogance. Conceit really means just to have a puffed up attitude, an opinion of oneself. We don't have to look very far in our culture right now to see pride, arrogance, conceit. Turn on the news, look at social media. All you have to do is look at prideful Putin, Putin who has extended this power grab into Ukraine and he's killing defenseless, innocent people. It's an ungodly war. It's unjust. It's unnecessary in every way, isn't it, church? Yes. And when we think about the pride and arrogance of this ungodly leader and the people who have joined him, it doesn't take long to say there is Pride. Pride is an issue. Easy to notice in the life of Putin, isn't it? Or how about in the life of the current administration in the United States? Don't talk about that, Greg, but I'm telling you, they're leading this country to hell in a handbasket. And they are not. They do not stand for God. Our nation does not stand for God any longer. And when we will not stand as a nation on the Word of God, you know, all you have to do is look at the pride and arrogance of continued abortions and increased abortions in our culture, the murder of unborn babies, we ought to protect them in the womb. And so we see a pride and arrogance. It's not just our president and vice president, it's the squad, the five or six, however many they want to say belong to that squad. There is pride and arrogance, very easy to see in our culture. It's on the news, it's in the media. But what about us? Is there pride and arrogance in our life? Very easy to identify in the lives of some people. But what about us? It's exactly what we see in Genesis chapter 11, if you'll notice with me. There was a pride and arrogance with the descendants of Noah after the flood. And if you look with me in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, now the whole world had one language and one common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. If you just look at these first two verses, there's an awful lot to learn. There was one language of the people, and who are the people? Well, the people are the table of nations in chapter 10, the descendants of Noah. They had one language, one common language. Many uh, scholars say it was Hebrew. We really don't know what the language was, but isn't it interesting that many of the world languages today uh, have similarities, flow off of the Hebrew language. But they had one language, one common language, and as people moved eastward, that's a verse that should stand out to us. In fact, you should underline that verse. As peace, people moved eastward, because there's a much deeper uh, thought here than just moving. In fact, this phrase became known as People moving away from God. People who moved eastward moved away from God. Think about this. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, God judged Adam and Eve, and he kicked them out of the east side of the garden. Do you remember? In chapter 4, verse 17, I believe, 
It's when, verse 16, when Cain is judged by God. It says this, that Cain says, So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He went east of Eden. So to go east meant to move out of the presence of the Lord. And that's going to stand out to us as we continue to study chapter 11. So they had one common speech and they moved eastward and they found a plain in Shinar and they settled there. there. Now there's a map, it should be a map that comes up for you on the screen. It is, it shows uh, Mesopotamia. That's where we're talking about. Mesopotamia means land between two rivers or between two rivers. It's between the Euphrates and the Tigris. And it is a very rich plain. Today it's modern day Middle East. That's the way we could think of it. And next week as we study chapter 12 of Genesis, there is a place that Abraham comes from. It's the land of Ur of the Chaldeans. It's right there in Mesopotamia. It's exactly where Abraham grew up. And it was a very rich plain, but it wasn't very rocky. And that's exactly where we see an attitude develop in the lives of the people who descended, who descended from Noah. Notice with me the attitude here in verse 3. They said to each other, come. Now they didn't just have a common language, they had what was what I consider a come on man attitude. And look at the come on man attitude. Come on, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. You see technology here being developed. Uh, They were able to make bricks and bake them. Now, generally, during this time, foundations of buildings would be made out of natural stone, God-given stone. Why? Because it's much stronger. It's much more reliable. But in order for them to get that kind of stone, it wasn't found in the valley there in Shinar. They would have had to carry it in. Well, that's too hard for us. Why wait on the Lord? We'll make our own bricks. So they make bricks. Notice the attitude. Let us make. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may, what? Make a name for ourselves. Uh, Raise up your Bible if you have your Bible with you. I'm so grateful to see you with your Bibles open. This is life-changing, the Word of God. And we see three specific statements. Let us make, let us build, let us what? Make. Let's unpack those three statements. Let us make bricks. Let's make our own bricks. We don't have to wait on God. It's an attitude that developed in the people of independence. Living independent from God, we can make it on our what? Own. Or how about this? Let us build a city and let us build a tower that goes to the sky, to the heavens. That's what that means. And it's interesting when you study this, that ziggurats came from this. Ziggurats were temples that were made by the nations around God's people following this event, and they became towers. If you were to see some of these unearthed, some of them were 300 feet wide and just as tall. The inside of them were empty except for a room, an upper room, that had a bed for false gods or goddesses to rest. I guess they need rest. And then they would put food to these false gods and goddesses, and it had little to do with the inside of that temple. It had more to do with the steps on the outside. Anyone here ever studied that? The steps on the outside needed the support, so they would build build them big and wide and tall. And as they built those steps going up those ziggurats, They would welcome their false god or goddess to come down. Look, we've built steps for you so you can come down to us. Well, there's a powerless God. You need us to build stairs for you to come down? Well, this particular tower had nothing to do with God, did it? It had everything to do with what? The people. 
Living independent from God, not only independent from God, let us build a city with a tower that goes to the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves. It had nothing to do with God. It was all about recognition and reputation. Does that speak to us today? That in our culture we're saying, you know what, let us make our own way. Let us live independent from God. Let me make my own way. Let me make my own path. I can do things my way. In fact, here's the way the people would be speaking. It's like shaking a fist to God. We can do what we want, where we want, when we want, and how we want. You're absolutely right. And you know what? We live in a culture just like that, don't we? Where people are saying, let me me make my own way. Let me make my own path. I don't need God to give me direction. I can live independent from God. In fact, I can live and do what I want, when I want, where I want, and how I want. Boy, it sounds an awful lot like today. Talk about pride. You know, Scripture talks an awful lot about pride. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 18 through 20. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Pride comes before a what? Fall. You know, pride in Scripture, over and over again, we see pride come to the surface in the lives of people. And here, people responding after the flood. Let me just mention the flood happened about 2348 B.C. When we read chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, it's 106 years removed from the flood. That's not very long, is it? In other words, they could look back to the story of Noah and they heard the story, the descendants of Noah. Do you think they heard about Noah building the ark and Noah being the only righteous man and only eight people in his family being saved? Do you think that people heard the story in his family? 106 years is not very long, church. And look at the pride and the conceit and the arrogance of people as we look at the descendants of Noah just 106 years following the flood. And here's the reason. Verse 4, then they said, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. At the judgment of the flood, following that, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1, God told Noah and his family, be fruitful and increase in number and... Fill the earth. Fill the earth. Look at the control of these people. We'll go where we want. We'll do what we want, when we want, how we want. But the Lord came down. Verse 5. He didn't use the steps of that tower, did he? The Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan will, do, will be impossible Excuse me, for them. Come, let us go down. Let us go down. Does that stand out to anybody? I would circle that. You know, we see that in Genesis 1.26. Let us create man in our image. Who is the us? Don't be afraid to say it. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, absolutely. There in the beginning at creation, here, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. And look, with one common language, look at the cooperation they have in doing evil together. If they have one common language, it's going to go from bad to what? Worse. Did God know that from heaven? Could God see what they were doing from heaven? Absolutely. And God comes down and he confronts the pride of the people. And so the Lord not only changed their language, gave them different languages. This is the beginning, by the way, 
of ethnic groups, not different races, different ethnic groups. And if you go back to chapter 2, verse or 10, chapter 10, verse 25, two sons were born to Eber. This is in Shem's family line. One was named Peleg, Peleg because in his time, the earth was divided. His name literally means divided. Just think of the judgment that God passes down here. He confuses their language, and then the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. What's it called? The Tower of what? Babel. Think about that. It's called the Tower of Confusion. Why is it the Tower of Confusion? Because God was not in their plans. It was the prideful arrogance of man doing things their way. That is why it is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world, and from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. The one thing they didn't want to happen still happened. Why? Because they are not in control. Who is in control? God is in control. And he showed them his power, and he revealed to them that they're powerless without God. Two things stand out to me. That when they were making plans without God and all of their pride, God shattered their plans. You ever tried to make plans without God? Raise your hand if you've made plans without God. I've been there. God ever shattered your plans? And you go, how on earth did I end up here? When you and I are making plans, godless plans, God will shatter our plans. God not only shattered their plans, he scattered the people. God ever scattered you in your life? Moved you away from something in your life that you desperately wanted? And God was saying, you really don't want what you're asking for. You know, some things really do stand out to me in this story, in this true narrative of a people who build a tower that was more about their own recognition and reputation. It was self-centered, it was self-glorifying, and it was self-gratifying. And it is this, that in the midst of this story, we see God's goodness, we see God's glory, and we see God's grace. Don't we see God's grace all throughout Scripture, church? When you think about the fall of mankind, Adam and Eve sinning, did God make a way to cover their sin? Did God offer forgiveness and grace to Adam and Eve? When Cain killed Abel, did God offer grace to Cain? When the people built the tower, did God offer grace to the people? You see, scattering them away from their own plans was God's way of saying, I'm protecting you from yourself. And when you don't want to glorify me, it's not going to go very well. And it just reminds me that if you and I are going to build great things in this life, then there are some things that we must do. You might want to write these down. Anyone want to build great things in this life? You want to build a great marriage? Raise your hand. Build a great marriage? You want to raise great children? Raise your hand. You want to raise awesome great-grandchildren? I hope I get to see my great-grandchildren. Our daughter-in-law came up and gave us a hug right before service, put me in tears. I looked at Amy and I said, we've got great daughter-in-laws. Iris is here. She gave birth to our first grandson, Nico. He was at the house last night. We want to build something great for him. And if we're going to build something great for him, we got to be a great family for God. Anyone here want to build a great career that says God's glory is all over this? I want to work for the Lord. Anyone want to do that? Anyone want to build great friendships, relationships? Anyone here want to build good habits in your life? that are passed on to the next generation. See, if we're going to build great things in our life, then we have to do specific things, and here they are. Number one, we have to invite God's presence into our life. We have to invite God's presence instead of trying to make something else the foundation of our life. How about this? Invite God, his presence, to be the foundation in your life and in mine, in your marriage and in mine, in your work and in mine, in your 
parenting and in mind. I could go on and on. Whatever it is, invite God's presence. And if God isn't the foundation, it is guaranteed to fail. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2, listen to what Solomon says. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. See, if we build without God being the foundation, it's guaranteed to what? It's going to fail. We don't want things to fail. If you and I are going to build great things in this life, we have to invite God's presence. It's what David said in Proverbs 18, 10 through 12. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it, a wall too high to scale. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Have we all in the room welcomed God's presence to be the foundation of our life? If we say, God, I need you more than anything else if I'm going to build a life that matters, that has impact. Have we welcomed the presence of the Lord in our family? Are we praying that God would make a difference in our lives? Here's number two. We have to invite God's plans into our life. We're all so busy making plans, aren't we? We're all busy making plans. Right now, Putin is making plans. Are his plans providing any sort of good in the world right now? Absolutely not. Are ours? Do our plans include God? Do we go to the Word of God and say, God, what are your plans for this situation in my life? What are your plans as I think about someone to marry? What are your plans as I consider having children? What are your plans as I consider a career that would bring you honor and glory? What are your plans when it comes to the type of friendships I should be building? The type of witness I should be in elementary school and in middle school and in high school? God, what are your plans for me? We have plenty of athletes in the room. Raise your hand if you're an athlete, young people. Raise your hands. You play in sports? Raise your hands. (laughs) Bill Gray raised his hand. Yeah, I'm a young guy that's an athlete. Uh, You know, when you see the athletes on TV today, man, so much pride and arrogance, so much godless behavior, and the younger generation is watching, and I would challenge the younger generation here to honor God with the gifts he's given you on the field and off the field, to be a witness and testimony to him. Don't join the crowd in doing what is wrong. There's never a wrong time to do the right thing. Include God in your plans. Include God's plans in your life, I should say, from a very young age. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, God says. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are always better than our ways. Amen. We have to invite God's plans in. We have to quit being about making our own plans and then saying, God, would you join me for my plans? How about this? Go to Scripture and ask God, what are your plans for my life? What's the best best direction here? Because God's word is a light unto our path, a lamp unto our what? Feet. God will guide our direction if we ask him. As here, I would just simply ask, what towers are we building? What prideful arrogance are we displaying in putting our plans to work without God? What towers are we building in our life? How are we acting in ways that are independent from God? And we say, God, you know what? I'll catch up with you later. I got some plans to fulfill here. How are we trying to live independent from God? And in what ways do I focus on recognition and reputation? rather than recognizing God and reflecting him in my life. 
Here's number three. We need to invite God's power into our life. I love Romans 8.31 says this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Why do we live such timid lives today? Why are we so afraid to stand up? If God is for us, if God is for us, why are we so timid? Why are so many Christians living timid lives when God didn't give us a spirit of timidity? He gave us a spirit of boldness. He gave us a spirit to overcome the fear of the world. Don't fear those who can kill the body, but fear him who after killing the body can throw the body into what? Hell, we have more fear of man today than we do of God. Where is the fear of God today? That's what Bright Christian Church has to be about. We're not about growing numerically. We're about growing spiritually. If we grow spiritually, God will bring the people because you're ready to share your witness and your testimony and tell them why their life can be different. Not just me, not just the elders, our entire church family. Why are we so afraid today in our culture? If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, what are we so afraid of? And God has so much he wants to do in our lives. But are we inviting the power of God to be on display in our lives? That's what I want more than anything else, is for the power of God to be on display in my life fearlessly. Compassionately, but fearlessly. And this morning when Amy came in to the church, she said, let me pray for you. It's so awesome to pray with my wife. And do you know what she prayed? She prayed that, God, this stage is not about us. This stage is all about you, God. That's why his word is on display. That's why God's glory is on display. This is not about Greg. It's not about you. It is about God. Here's number four. We have to invite God's purpose into our life. God has given every one of us in the room everything that we need to live according to his purpose. And he promised us that his purpose is greater than any purpose that you and I can pursue. In John 10.10, Jesus said the enemy, Satan, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In John 10, 10b, that seek and save actually comes out like this. He says, I came to give you a life, a life to the what? Full. God's desire, his purpose is to give us a life that is full, that will bring him honor and glory. Psalm 33, 12 says this, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, this country continues to move further and further away from God. You don't have to look very far to see that. But you know what? It's happening in many churches today, too, where people are claiming to follow Jesus. But you look at their life, and they're just moving further and further away from God. What does Scripture say? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the one true God. As the blessing of God continues to be pulled from the U.S. because people aren't living in a way that God can bless or will bless, I started to think about what this text actually teaches us in Genesis chapter 11. And it teaches us this statement. Blessed is the person whose God is the Lord. Amen? Have you made Jesus your Lord today? If not, your tower will come crumbling down. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful to be here today and to be in your unchanging truth, the word of God. And Lord, as we look all around, there's pride, there's arrogance. God, would you deal with the pride and arrogance in our lives? Would we identify it? Would we acknowledge it? Would we confess it? And would we repent of it, turning back to you, the living God? Would we ground our lives on you, the living God? Would we seek your word for guidance? And God, would we live as a testimony of who you are in our lives, reflecting your goodness, reflecting your glory, and reflecting your grace? All in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.